and I'm starting the webinar. We're opening our gates and more. Welcome in, come see what kind of life's in store. With open doors, open arms, open minds, open hearts, it's for everyone to find. See, get what ocean water fronts. Now let's get all we're offering. Our crowds are friendly. Join us, please. We kick it off like special teams. Wait, listen to the music playing now. Latin, Asian, and Jamaican sounds cuisine to taste from all around. Can't be lost with what you found, Lynn. A platform here for everything For all this activist computer trains Give it a chance, come and dance Find romance or advance your education Make your plans Look, shoppers coming from miles away Murals, paintings, photos, up and gaze Our history is deep and rich We'd love to see you add to this We don't have to worry about what's passing Let me know what's going on Good morning with us in the morning Good morning, you're here, you're here You're here, you're here, you're here Living it up in a district, working, loving, making friends. Living it up in a district, you won't come out the way you came in. Living it up in a district, working, loving, making friends. Living it up in a district, you won't come out the way you came in. get us started yeah let's do it hello everyone I'm Carolyn one of the original facilitators on this project thank you all for being here hola todos gracias por estar aquí yo soy Carolina todavía estoy aprendiendo español pero nosotros tenemos a Claudia Zarazú de MAPC para ayudar con traducciones después la presentación no necesitan and what were you all mastering during quarantine <laughs> Welcome, Claudia. <laughs> Gracias, Carolyn. Bienvenidos. Las presentaciones que van a ver esta noche serán en inglés. Sin embargo, el contenido estará disponible en español en la página lynncommon.com. Si tienen alguna pregunta durante el evento, usen la función de Q&A que está abajo en la barra de herramientas. Aquí estaré para ayudarles. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Right. Uh, thank you, Claudia. <laughs> As mentioned, translations will be available for viewing of this post-session recording on Lynn in Common. We'll talk more about that platform later on in the program. We're opening in a secured webinar format today so as to assure best practices to allow for secured but accessible participation and to minimize the potential for disruption. <laughs> Any participant who's disruptive to the proceedings will be immediately removed from the event and will not be able to rejoin. Finally, in the event that the program is disturbed by Zoom bombing, it will immediately be terminated and rescheduled. Now on a lighter note, <laughs> I'd like to kick things off with a word from our city leader, Mayor McGee. Wonderful. Thank you, Mayor. No, <laughs> I don't think he's on quite yet, but he'll be there in a moment. All right. I'm going to slide him in. I know he's a VIP. We can we can improvise and make arrangements later because we need to hear from him. I'm going to skip too because I do see he is here. Mr. Mark Drayson, uh, uh, MAPC's executive director, um, to say a few words about MAPC's transformative regional work. And I thought this was my opportunity to be to be disruptive. No. All right. No, it isn't. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I know the mayor will be joining us soon. Uh, playing the role of taking up time while waiting for Mayor McGee is a role that I have done before. So I feel like I'm pretty good at it at this point in time. I do want to thank particularly Carolyn and Lauren and Carla, all of whom are here and have played such an incredible role moving this project forward. 
It hasn't always been easy. And we all know we were working on an arts project in the midst of a pandemic. When let's face it, there were a few other things to do and people's minds and hearts were often elsewhere. But I think it's fitting that as we reach what hopefully God willing will be the end of this pandemic, uh, we can engage in the joyful process of seeing the concepts that these artists have to place before us and of giving the public an opportunity to express their views for the art that will finally be installed at this location in the city of Lynn. Uh, I am also very thankful to the members of our staff, Jen Erickson, our director of arts and culture, Anna Sengupta, who is our incoming director of arts and culture, Claudia and Dan and Allison and Margie, and probably other members of, of my staff whose names I don't have directly in front of me, but who have helped to make this process possible uh, throughout the last several months. Yolando, I see Yolando is there. And, uh, and it's an indication of our commitment, not only to good regional planning, not only to Lynn, but also to our concept that arts and culture is a way forward in our society, that you don't get anywhere without joy and beauty and engagement yeah. oh. and history. And you certainly don't get anywhere without Tom McGee. So I'm done with what I have to say now, Tom, I've taken up a few minutes for you to get on Zoom. And now we're gonna turn it over to the great mayor of Lee. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Sorry, I'm trying to get on my computer and I'm still living in the 20th century technology wise. So um, but it's great to be here. I wanna thank everyone, uh, uh, Mark, team at MAPC for uh, all the work you've done to get us to this point today. Uh, it's been a long process and obviously the pandemic has jumped into what had been, uh, we anticipated uh, a pretty exciting opportunity to commission a, a really great piece of public art and stretched it out a lot longer than we anticipated. But it's really exciting to know that we're, we're uh, here, we're ready to go and uh, uh, this pro you know, we're, we're really ready for it. So uh, I wanna, uh, the project team, uh, uh, was able to pioneer a new model for commissioning public art, um, one that emphasizes community engagement, engagement which is something we've, uh, I know the people at MAPC and the others on, on the call know that's what we've been working on the last three and a half plus years since I've been on is uh, working together to get the community a part of uh, what we do and really public engagement and we're continuing to build on that. So I'm um, really proud of that part of this effort and, and, and how we're moving forward. Uh, I also wanna thank the five artists. Um, who are presenting uh, the concepts this evening. Congratulations on your participation. Uh, exciting to see your interest in uh, adding to what we uh, have uh, in this uh, city we love. Uh, we've got a great waterfront, uh, great history, uh, but more importantly, the people in this community are what makes this a, a great place. So to have uh, your interest in creating some really exciting public art that we can all enjoy is, um, we're really excited to have your interest and have those uh, uh, those perspectives uh, looking at what we in the community feel is important. Uh, I know that uh, uh, young people in our community are excited about this. We're all excited and uh, this really gives an opportunity for us to build on what's going on in our arts and cultural district and have really a signature piece in a location that really continues to thrive. And you know, I was down there earlier today with um, uh, actually a reporter from the Globe talking about <laughs> things that are happening um, and and also my uh, uh, I'm uh, leaving in January so talking a little bit about that but we were down on Exchange Street looking at all the exciting things happening down there and you could feel the vibrancy in the air about uh, that area and how it's building across the whole district so this is an important piece of that uh, and uh, looking forward to the presentations uh, we're looking to continue to build on the pride and the love of this community we have in this uh, uh, installation is going to be a part of that. So thank you all for, for the work and for the community members who are alive with us uh, and involved in this public process. I want to thank you uh, uh, for watching or those that will be watching later on. Um, that's what this process is all about. It's a public process and you're going to be part of our decision making on choosing uh, from five really exciting pieces of art to, uh, to make a signature uh, piece in a great location downtown in an area that continues to thrive and grow and uh, uh, with a really bright future ahead. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all. And uh, thank you, Mark. And I don't know if Carolyn, if you're gonna take this from here. Uh, 
but it's good to see you on here as well for all your passion and work. It's great to have you involved in this. And I know that everybody in, uh, that's been involved in this has put in a lot of time and effort uh, because um, you be believe strongly in this opportunity for us. So thanks for everyone that helped make this happen. Um, thanks, to, thanks for Lauren sharing her computer with me. <laughs> and uh, look forward to uh, making this happen and uh, having the community help us make the right decision. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for that warm introduction, uh, Mayor McGee. And thank you, Mark. I have to say, we sincerely appreciate all that you and your organization does uh, to assist in supporting projects like this, but also communities like ours. Um, I, <laughs> I think after all the work you all have done in Lynn, you have part ownership of the city. <laughs> but it's good. I hope we can deliver something that you'll be very proud to uh, have ownership of. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, I am here representing my amazing home city of Lynn, Massachusetts, on a project that I'm extremely proud of. It's called Lynn Stellation. And yes, I'm a sucker for all things puns and mashups having to do with my city name. <laughs> Uh, a number of years ago, the city implemented a beautiful reconstruction of the corner of Mount Vernon uh, and Exchange Street downtown, what we are referring to today as the Mount Vernon Street Plaza. Um, if you spend any amount of time on that corner, you've noticed an empty circle in the middle of that plaza. Um, we've had some incredible community contributions to the space, um, lovely planters donated by the Downtown Lynn Beautification Project, exceptional artwork by our groups at Raw Artworks and Center Board's Vision Space. And of course, uh, we have to mention our wildly popular Farmer's Market uh, hosted by the Food Project. And thanks to those previous successful activations, we're at a point where we can really start to think about sharing and utilizing the space for something long-term and year-round, something that reflects the spirit of Lynn and livens the gateway to the Downtown Lynn Cultural District district uh, as a destination and increases the use of this plaza as a gathering space but especially now, especially now that restrictions have been lifted <laughs> but most importantly it is something that the community can call their own and be proud of um, Q linstallation oh thank you this is a okay 100 percent community driven creative community placekeeping initiative yes say it a thousand times fast intended to create an equitable and participatory public art infrastructure and i'm excited to reiterate that it's been deemed a new regional model for municipal artist collaboration by the office of inspector general contributing to our reputation as the city of firsts i'd like to quickly acknowledge the people who are making this happen uh first the mayor of our great city Mayor Thomas McGee, uh, Director of Community Development, Jamie Marsh, Lynn's Associate Planner, Lauren Drago, MAPC's Executive Director, Mark Drayson, um, and our Project Manager from Kick It Up Consulting, Carla Sherry. And again, I'm Carolyn Cole, I'm here with the Creative Collective. Uh, I gotta mention the special VIPs in the room. Um, aside from you all, artists and community members, <laughs> uh, one of Lynn's most well-known local arts advocates, Senator Brendan Creighton, Representative Lori Ehrlich, uh, Councilor at Large Hong Net, candidate for Councilor at Large pre and President of the North Shore Juneteenth Association, Nicole McLean, and candidate for Council Award to Elizabeth Figueroa. I'm sorry if I missed anybody. I tried to get the registration form at the last second so that I wouldn't, but I know it happens. Um, and last but not least, by a long shot, uh, we could not have done any of this without the support of a technical assistance award from the greatest team I've had the privilege of working with, uh, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. That includes Anna Sengupta, MAPC's Assistant Director of Arts and Culture, Regional uh, Arts and Culture Planners, Claudia Sarazua and Daniel Koff, and MAPC's General Counsel, Marjorie Weinberger. Special thanks also to the MBTA, the DPW, the Lynn Public Arts Commission, all municipal participants, and the countless community representatives, organizers, and advocates who have assisted with every single step of this process dating back to 2018. I do feel like I'm accepting an Oscar. So if there's anyone I've missed, you know who you are. <laughs> go to bed, Timmy. Um, all right. So uh, how this webinar will go is that we'll introduce you to our five finalists. They'll present their concepts to you, and you'll have a chance to ask questions of them at the end of everyone's presentations. Um, Claudia, would you like to give a quick recap of this for all of today's Spanish-speaking guests, please? Gracias, Carolyn. Ahora vamos a ver los conceptos que han preparado los cinco finalistas. 
Los artistas han preparado su presentación por escrito y su texto e imágenes estarán disponibles en español en la página de leaningcommon.com. Después de sus presentaciones, los arti artistas estarán disponibles para una sesión de preguntas. Si tienen preguntas para ellos o algún miembro del equipo técnico, por favor usen la función de Q&A en la barra baja de herramientas de Zoom y yo ay ayudaré a traducir o interpretar. Gracias. Carolyn. Gracias de nuevo, Claudia. Another year of quarantine and I could have done that paragraph as well. <laughs> Uh, so it's time to meet our artists. Yay. We've received a total of 46 national artist submissions, artists who are globally recognized uh, for their artworks and their contributions. And we also highly encouraged local artists to apply. All applicants had to adhere to a significant set of eligibility criteria that focused heavily on community engagement. Uh, all right, artists, are you ready? Yep. Here we go. <laughs> uh, this, these will be uh, presented to you in alphabetical order. Uh, please welcome artist number one, Yeti Frankel, with her concept, Starfish. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? This is a proposal that is based on um, the joy that I had as a child growing up in Lynn. I grew up in a big Victorian house across the street from Lynn Beach. And I used to spend my summers swimming and looking under rocks and tide pools and um, thoroughly enjoyed that. And I think the beach and the Atlantic Ocean um, is a, a, big, um, a big part of the Lynn community. Next slide, please. So this sculpture is about 14 feet high with the base. It is a, a bench. So the, so the base, the circular base is meant to be a bench that people can rest on. Um, and then the fish and the items on top all together, um, a total of a, a height of 14 feet. It is a cement and fiberglass mesh uh, sculpture, which is formed around a steel armature and uh, covered with mosaic. So all of the color that you see is mosaic decoration. And the mosaic decoration, uh, some of it, uh, much of it can be done in workshops with the community. So it's a participatory process. Um, next slide, please. So for instance, the wave pattern on the base um, that can all be done with the community, um, as can uh, the images that are on the fish itself. Uh, the way that works, and I can show you um, in the next slide if you want to move over to that. Uh, one more. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So this is the a mural and mosaic project that is in um, right on the side of Lynn Arts Building in downtown Lynn. Um, and the uh, archway in it uh, is mosaic. Um, I know it might be a little bit hard to see, but that those panels that form that sort of arch um, that's in back of the girl in the green shirt who's drawing, those are essentially um, two feet high by three feet wide sections of mosaic that were done in workshops with the kids in, in Lynn uh, high schools and middle schools. Um, and almost anybody can work on a mosaic. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot of um, space. It doesn't take a lot of a lot of skill. Um, although people can put as much time and skill and effort into it as they want, um, but it's a very nice process for for working with the public because basically people sit at a, at a table. They work on their own little section, and then it gets taped together and it can be stored until it's time to do the installation. So as I said, much of the mosaic. Um, that will be decorating the fish sculpture um, would be done in workshops with the public. So, you know, people are invested in it because they, they help to make it. And are there any more slides or is that it? Okay. I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Yeti. I know it's never easy to go first, but you're all pros. So, 
<laughs> You're much smoother than I would have been. Um, thank you. All right, so now we have artist number two, uh, Fitzhugh Carroll and his concept, Jumbo T. Jacks. Okay, howdy, everybody. Um, my name is Fitzhugh, um, and I'm a uh, yeah, sculptor based in Brooklyn, New York, um, but I grew up in New Hampshire and, and went to RISD for, uh, for school, so I sort of know the area and, and um, you know, I'm not going to call myself local, but I'm familiar, you know, and kind of grew up in the New England area there. Um, and yeah, my sculptures are generally, I wanted to start by just sort of a context slide for folks, um, are these large works that are in public spaces, and they're sort of taken from silhouettes of landscapes and seascapes and celestial objects and um, places that I've seen or, you know, been or imagined. Um, the, these context images here um, show sort of, uh, I guess, context for what the piece inland would sort of, you know, just scale and, and, and sort of uh, scope of what it could be like in uh, inland. These are in public spaces around generally the Northeast in New York, um, although the beach one is in Australia, which is kind of crazy and was really intense to figure out, but fun. Um, anyhow, so this is some context for next slide, please. Okay, uh, the sculpture that I'm proposing for uh, the Mount Vernon Plaza called Jumbo T. Jacks is a nod to the children's game of Jacks. Um, and when I was sort of looking at particularly the rendering of this uh, image in the plaza, I started thinking about the game, uh, a game of Jacks and that this sort of represented one of those sort of crisscrossing shapes to me in, a, in an abstract way. Um, and then I sort of looking when I was playing with the rendering and spinning, and spinning it around, I sort of zoomed out and thought about the T station as being uh, almost like you were looking down at a kid's play floor in their room and the tea station became small and the jacks was like something that was sort of a kid scale and um, anyway that's kind of how I came up with the concept for what it was called and, and I like that it was sort of bringing me to a place of play um, and uh, that's kind of what my work is all about generally speaking is kind of accessing that place in my own process and providing that for viewers of the work. Um, I conceived of three colorways. This is the first one here. Um, this one's based off of a sunset at Red Rock Park. Um, I have personally spent time at Nahant Beach sort of at that time of day and seen sunset and, and know sort of what that, you know, drama can look like there. Um, and it also sort of, one sort of particular thing about this colorway, it, someone had mentioned in our first meeting, installation meeting, uh, had brought up the, the Carita Kent's gas tank paintings um, south of Boston. I just remember going by those so much as a kid. And, you know, these aren't certainly not the same colors, but there was sort of a fun connection that I had to imagining or, or the sense of play and wonder I had as a child seeing those big colors that I sort of somehow have wrapped into, into this color scheme. Um, the second colorway, next slide, please, is so this is based off of the seal of the city of Lynn. Um, this one I really like because it takes something that represents the city, but is sort of an abstract, not abstract, I mean, it's a physical thing, but it, it exists in two dimensional space and potentially on surfaces in three dimensions, but this took it and sort of brought the colorway out to, to play, I guess you could say. Um, a little more subdued, generally speaking in tone, but also still kind of bright and vibrant um, and inviting within, within the, the plaza space. Uh, third, next slide, please. The third one is sort of a, you know, all the same shape, but riffing off of the local colors. So stuff from the tea station, surrounding environments. Um, again, you know, big and placemaking, but still a bit more subdued in this, uh, in this case. And then the next slide. Uh, this this pic image just sort of speaks to my process, creative process. Um, I generally start things sort of as cutting paper and models, and and then sort of put them together like card castle style construction, I guess you might say. And that's how I start pretty much everything. And then I pick some image, things that I like and scale them up to, you know, models like this, tabletop models. And that's, you know, this is literally showing the process of color development um, and model development for this installation. Uh, but it's also a nod to what I'm imagining for community involvement and, and something uh, for kids surrounding this installation. Um, that process that I do of, of ideation with cutting paper and stuff, um, is I think a way that, uh, a way to knit this sculpture into the community is to create a lesson plan sort of based off of that ideation for kids to use, or for teachers to use in local schools where kids can take paper and cut out in art classes and then, you know, punch holes, do things, combine them in their own ways and find shapes that they find inspiring. Um, and what I like about that, this, this lesson plan that I've conceived that local kids could be 
engaged in is that they might be the very same kids who are coming and going, passing this sculpture on a daily basis. They could do that, uh, you know, work on that lesson in school. And then also just as sort of a larger concept, I think showing that you can conceptualize something, um, you know, within your mind's eye and, and then just, you know, it can become a reality sort of on this scale is sort of a fun thing that I'd like to present and represent to kids. Um, That's perfect fits you. Okay. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank Done. you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fitzhugh. Um, I, I, you know, these sessions are so important because you can look at a picture online, but to hear the story behind it just sort of changes your view of everything. Um, so thank you all for, for, you know, putting all, all the hard work into these presentations for us today. Um, great. So up next is artist number three, Beth Nybeck, with her concept, The In-Between. Beth. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Beth Nybeck, and I'm a nationally recognized uh, public artist and sculptor. And it's really a joy to be here with you today to share my concept and the work that I have created in the past. I've been creating large scale site specific sculpture for over a decade. I design and build all of my own work. And I create sculpture that's um, abstract and often centered around a spirit of collaboration. Um, community engagement is really a critical role for me in my process, um, how I enjoy working. I think that art making becomes richer and really deeper when you bring people into the fold with you. Um, in past projects, um, I'm going to go to the next slide, sorry. Um, in past projects, I really work closely with communities to create a storytelling dialogue that then gets um, folded into the sculpture, usually on the surface of the material in, in the, final, the final piece. And so I want to introduce my project. It's uh, entitled The In-Between, and um, it's just a, an artwork. You can go to the next slide. Uh, it's an artwork that is interactive, and it's bold, and it, it tries to capture really the heart and the soul of your history and your heritage, and also uh, the dreams you have for the future of your community. Uh, in a nutshell, it's um, these two geometric uh, human heads. One is facing towards the future and the other is facing towards the past. And that there is this in-between space that is kind of cut out and carved that you can enter into the sculpture. And it is really meant to be both physically um, and collaboratively engaging to the audience. And when I think about what makes a community vibrant, it's the people. And it's not just one person, it's a collective of people. And um, this sculpture is hoping to really capture the tapestry of who you are, where you've come from, and then also where you are going. And so I wanna know what makes you who you are? Where have you come from? What's impacted your life? Um, and how's that shaped uh, the direction that you, you live and breathe and your passion and um, also, just who you are. I want to hear those stories. And I also want to hear like, what is, what are you fired up about for the future? What are you passionate about changing in your community? What do you have a heart for? Um, I believe that there's really great power when we write down our, our, uh, our ideas, our goals for the future, because that puts us into action and it helps us to really fuel and charge forward. And I want to know what your community yearns for um, and what you want to really change go to the next slide please. The interior of this sculpture is just really this kind of haven space. It's a space that um, is supposed to be kind of quiet reflection and it is where um, it's designed for you to walk through and to be part of and um, this is the surface where all of the, the ideas of your, your past, your stories from your past and also your, um, your dreams and your goals for the future will be cut out of the surface of the metal. Um, and the material choice for this piece is really a, an elegantly brushed stainless steel. And that is, um, I've been doing this a long time in, in outdoor spaces and um, the heart cry, one of the heart cries of the selection committee was an artwork that was really low maintenance. And this does really great in um, adverse weather conditions and is really great and easy to maintain. And the finish is really beautiful and timeless. More than anything, I believe in storytelling. I believe that it deepens our understanding of humanity. It's how we come to know more about those who are different than us. And, um, and it's how we gain new perspective. And ultimately sharing our stories is really how we can really come to connect with one another. And that's really the, the crux of this um, 
this whole piece. Um, and this next slide, please. So how do we do this? You know, like how do we how do we share our stories? How do we connect? How does this happen in actuality? And it's critical for me to reach residents that really span both um, age and also diversity in your community. This artwork should reflect who you are in every aspect, and which means being multilingual. And so on the screen here, there these are events and places in which I hope to connect with. And so what does that look like? I would be at these events with a model of the artwork. I would explain to people who haven't heard about what's happening. Um, and I would engage them in this idea of um, actually handwriting your stories down um, on a piece of paper. And it's those words that will then get put onto the surface of the sculpture. So um, really it's been a sheer honor to create this design um, to honor your past and, and look into the future. This artwork was designed with ADA uh, coding in mind. So you'll be able to access this. Um, I hope that you would be curious by it. I would hope that you would be ex excited to explore the inside and take time to read the thoughts of your neighbors. Thank you, Beth. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you, Beth. I, I see Carlos sort of like the proverbial like playoff music at the award shows like <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> you're doing a great job, Carla and uh, and you as well artists here just phenomenal. Um, thank you. Thank you again. It was beautiful. All right. Uh, now, please welcome artist number four, uh, Kevin Orlowski in Orlowski studio with his concept laces of Lynn. Hi, I'm Kevin Orlowski of Orlowski Studio in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm honored to be a finalist and really excited to present my concept for Linstallation. A little bit about me, I graduated from Savannah College of Art and Design in 2004, and shortly after that, I moved to Richmond and co-founded a community-focused arts nonprofit called Art on Wheels. As founding artistic director of Art on Wheels, I have over a decade of experience conducting arts outreach and developing community and public art projects that engage people in thoughtful and innovative ways. As an artist, I'm a strong creative problem solver and community-minded thinker, and I'm intentional in my inclusion and marginalized people in my projects. This project, Laces of Lynn, is a celebration of community participation and pride that ties the history of Lynn as a shoe mecca to the values of your diverse and growing city in a fun and playful way. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the concept for my sculpture. Through my conversations with different residents around Lynn, I discovered a duality between pride and the rich history of Lynn and a changing and growing city that embraces its diversity. To represent this history, the form of the sculpture is composed of interwoven shoelaces, which rise from the ground to an apex. To show the strength of a diverse community coming together, each lace is constructed from dozens of words that will be submitted by community members and describe a key trait or core value which represents themselves. These characteristics and values are the lasting soul of this community, which is a second historical reference to Lynn resident and Black American inventor Jan Ernst Matt Seliger, who invented the lasting machine to last souls on the shoes. Next slide, please. These submitted words curated by local writers and poets will be plasma cut into steel and painted in a palette of vibrant colors. The uplifting colorful shapes invite viewers to explore, encouraging playful movement throughout the interior of the piece. The rendering shown here is 10 by 15 by 12 feet, and the general shape plays with the architecture and the train station. However, the finalized form can be adjusted through community input because I want this work to really belong to you. As a result of my community-centered approach, I believe we will create a sculpture that is full of meaning and has unique cultural relevancy, which will act as a beacon of unity and be a landmark of home. Community engagement is central to my artistic process and a founding principle of my career as a public artist. By having residents identify their own personally cherished traits, we are gifted a collection of community values which demonstrate the universal human condition and give us profound insight on the often overlooked ways we can connect to others in our community. Next slide, please. For this piece, I wanna showcase what makes Lynn unique while revealing common values and interests among its residents. To do this, I will engage with residents through in-person and online guided workshops that use mindfulness to help people identify words that, re that reflect their uniqueness and personal identity. With a goal to reach at least 450 individuals, anyone can submit a word to be included in the sculpture. I will hold open public workshops and collaborate with local nonprofits to reach marginalized populations. Using language in the artwork makes it more inclusive for participation and increases multi-generational and multicultural responses. 
It also allows us to include multiple languages that express local demographics and seeing these different languages of a, in a piece of permanent artwork instills community pride. Additionally, an in-depth engagement program with raw artworks will teach my philosophy for public and community art and allow young artists to develop their own concepts for public art in their neighborhoods, which can be exhibited alongside the unveiling of this sculpture. Next slide, please. Once installed, the sculpture creates an immersive experience. Viewers can walk into the sculpture and read and snap pictures of all the traits and characteristics that build Lynn's community and find ways they can connect and relate to fellow residents. My goal is for the people of Lynn to have a sense of ownership of this sculpture. So that it isn't just an artist's work on display, but that the community itself has an artwork that belongs to them. At its heart, this sculpture is about connectivity. I hope that Lynners will find ways to connect to each other through this piece in many different ways. The colorful forms, playful shapes, and joyful message encourage an immersive and memorable experience. I want viewers to see this piece as a physical representation of everything that makes Lynn a unique place to call home, while connecting the path from its rich history to the evolving present and aspiring for a better future. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Carla, you can stay dark. <laughs> no kidding. Um, wonderful. And lastly, here's uh, artist team number five, Ryan Swanson and the Urban Conga with their concept, Periscope. Thanks, Carolyn. It's an honor for me to be here tonight with you all. Um, I'm the founder and creative director of the Urban Conga, and I'm just one part of the Urban Conga team. We're a multidisciplinary design studio comprised of a diverse group of creatives focus on sparking community activity and social interaction through open-ended play. We achieve this by working with communities to create inclusive, engaging, and site-specific work that sparks creativity, exploration, and free choice learning within the built environment. Through this work, we explore the idea of a playable city as an ecosystem of playable opportunities intertwined with an existing urban infrastructure. And when we talk about play, we're talking about how we can develop engaging moments for all demographics to stop and engage not only with the work, but also with each other. The work becomes more than just a photogenic monument on a pedestal, and it becomes an ever-changing, open-ended platform, sparking conversations, relationships, knowledge, creativity, and more. Through developing this work, this type of work in different settings worldwide, our unique team of creatives understands how to make work that is not only engaging and playable, but also durable and long-lasting within the public realm. We utilize universal design principles to make work that is safe, inclusive, and engaging for all. Next slide, please. I'm excited to present to you all today the concept titled Periscope, a playable installation creating a way to look at the city through a new lens. While visiting and talking with community members of Lynn, we noticed that its uniqueness in life came from the journey of the in-between. For most, it seems the identity of city of Lynn isn't about one building, monument, or historical moment. It's about the variety of people and places that make it what it is. With this understanding of the city, we knew we didn't want to create a concept that was just an object sitting within the space focused inward on itself. But instead, we wanted it to become a catalyst for exploration of the city and community operating around it. A piece that becomes a wayfinding component for those traveling within the city to find new places and people that they might have not once seen or experienced. Periscope becomes a tool to highlight other artwork, landscapes, businesses, events, and more happening throughout the city. Each of the structures are placed facing the cardinal and ordinal directions, allowing the work to serve as a wayfinding component within the square. Next slide, please. The units will each contain a graphic of distances to a specific location in that direction, encouraging people to venture to the spaces they might have not once gone to. Each of these units will also serve as a periscope, an optical instrument used to see from a different perspective. It allows one of the pieces to experience and start looking at the city and space in a uniquely different way. The piece becomes an ever-changing landmark, taking on the identities of its user while showcasing the city and its community. Next slide, please. So often we're asked how we come up with these concepts. And for us, our designs are always driven from the feedback of the community we are working with. We see our studio as a tool for the community to create something that they want to see within their city or neighborhood. To accomplish this, prior to having any designs or ideas for this project, we met with several community members and also held multiple digital design engagement sessions with members of Girls Inc. organization. We noticed some common trends that came up during these discussions with the community members and their excitement around the variety of places and people within the city, but also heard many places and areas that some knew of and others didn't. 
Through these initial discussions is where we developed our concept for Periscope to become a platform to encourage people to explore the city, its different communities through a new lens than the normal one. As the project continues to develop, we expect to continue this dialogue with you all and other community members who might have not been here tonight and in those initial meetings. As a part of this process, we see the community informing the colors, viewports of the periscope, the destinations highlighted on the pieces, and also see these destinations potentially changing over time. Next slide, please. Play is our natural driver as humans to discover, explore, and interact with others. Periscope utilizes its playable design to become a multifunctional opportunity for wayfinding, as well as a place to relax, converse, read, perform, and more. It is designed to allow people to pass through the space as well as hang out on the units themselves, creating an open-ended platform that can be programmed in a multitude of ways. Each of the units not only serve as a directional wayfinding, but also individual periscopes that allow you to explore the world through the eyes of someone else. A kid can begin to see the city, the height of an adult and vice versa. It becomes a playful gesture, encouraging people to slow down and look at the changing landscape around them. On each of the, each of the directional units, will be a vinyl graphic that will distance, that will, with the distance to a specific location chosen by the community. It won't say what the place is, but instead will encourage the person to discover what it might be. Periscope becomes a vibrant gesture of open to play, encouraging communal conversation, exploration, and discovery. It utilizes play to begin to break down social barriers and connect the community as one within the once underutilized public space. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. <laughs> uh, I guess I think I speak for most people when I say we'd be fortunate to welcome any one of these spectacular designs to our downtown. Uh, and I'm sure after this, you can all see the critical standards of community input and engagement uh, each of these artists had to uh, adhere to. And well, you all have exceeded our expectations. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure these presentations turn, started turning some wheels out in our audience. Now is your chance to engage with and ask those burning questions of our finalists. We encourage you to use the raise your hand function, or you can submit your questions or comments in the Q&A function as well. Uh, here to moderate our Q&A is Carla Sherry. Hey, Carla. Another member of our all women team. <laughs> So take it away, Carla. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, artists, for your awesome presentations. While I wait for um, some questions to pop up, we did have one question come through um, earlier for all of the artists, which I will, I will take you through uh, in the order of appearance of the artists we have already. And I would just ask the artist to keep it to a 30 second response just for the issue of time. And so everyone can have a, a chance to chime in. Our first question from Sheila, how do you think your piece fits with the area? Uh, Yeti, we'll have you go first. Oh, I think you're on mute, Yeti. Can you, there you go. Okay. All right. We'll give you 30 seconds starting now. <laughs> All right. So if it's in the area, um, uh, this spot where the, where the sculpture will be located is near the ocean. And so it's very relevant from that point of view, but also it's just, it's whimsical, it's fun. It's a very lighthearted piece, which I think um, suits that sort of, uh, you know, necessity that people have in their day as they're rushing around. Um, to, to, to feel sort of the, the, the something joyful and colorful and, uh, you know, silly, but. All right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Fits you, you're up next. Uh, well, <clears throat> in one aspect, it's sort of the final color selection and how that connects, uh, connects to the city directly. And then I sort of, I have a similar take on it, sort of how uh, Yeti said, which is just a vibrant, color and a vibrant object to um, just enliven community and, and it's there's portals to see through and jump through and, and engage uh, engage visitors and and onlookers perfect beth 
Wonderful. I would say that mine, um, instead of like wanting to blend into the, the plaza space, kind of breaks up the space of quite a bit. It's meant to, as you're walking through um, the environment, to catch your eye and to draw you in. It's a, a human figure, so it's really recognizable and relatable to all of us and um, meant to draw you into the space and um, in hopes that you would connect. All right. Boy, you guys are good. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I think uh, that this piece, it, since it is a piece about trying to connect everybody with Lynn, a, a train station is kind of a central place of connecting to the world around you. So I think that's how it really plays. The shape is kind of like a wave shape that goes up a little bit at the end. I think that also references the ocean, which is nearby because that's a wave shape. Um, but it also represents this moving forward motion, which um, something with that's central for the city, I think, would is a good place for it. Excellent, thank you, Kevin. Ryan? Yeah, so we see Periscope being kind of creating this kind of landmark to the space, but at the same time, you know, the main kind of thing around Periscope is that it's pushing you outward into the city. So it's not necessarily about that inward of the piece, but how can we use that, the piece as an opportunity to explore more throughout the city? Um, and we see each of those Periscope elements kind of focused on a particular point within that area, really kind of driving you to different directions and locations. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question from Julie. I would love to hear more about the artist's thoughts around the longevity of the works and how they should be best maintained by the city of Lynn. Um, Yeti, this might take a little longer than 30 seconds. We'll give you a minute. Um, well, the piece is pretty solid. Um, it has a steel armature. So the armature is really everything. That, that's, that's, you're not going to be able to knock it over <laughs> or do much damage to it um, in terms of the, the, the basic structure. Uh, and then the, the piece itself is molded around that armature and is made up of fiberglass mesh and cement, um, layers of fiberglass mesh and cement. So it's pretty solid. And then it's covered with um, ceramic and, uh, and glass mosaic. Um, most of it is ceramic um, and some of the decoration around the base may be glass um, because it is better uh, protected in, on, on the, the lower part of the base if it's inset. Um, it should, I, I, I know um, of other sculptures like this that have held up for about 20, 20, 30 years. It's sort of a, a I mean, you can look at Gaudi in, in um, Barcelona, right? Gaudi is the best example of this particular type of, of sculpture um, and technique. And his stuff has been around, I don't know, a long, long, long time. Excellent. Thank you, Yeti. Uh, Fitzhugh. Okay. Um, well, the sculpture itself, I mean, made out of uh, mild steel, extremely durable, very long lasting, um, especially when the paint is initially applied properly with primers and top coats. And then when maintained properly, um, it's got a very, very long uh, horizon. Uh, just speaking from past experience and this being a very similar um, paint application in a public space, there would be you know, multiple coats of, of, I mean, primer and top coats. And then usually um, we'll have sort of a protocol where if something gets chipped, scuffed, graffiti, whatever it is, um, the particular paint is made available for either, depending on what how the maintenance contract goes for, you know, uh, a very clear um, protocol for DOT folks to do touch-ups or whoever's, whoever's doing that. But the general paint coat, um, you know, you've got five to 10 years of, depending on which side and UV exposure, you've got very, very good longevity on the paint. Um, and anything can be touched up with a paint spec that's provided. Perfect. Uh, Beth. So I've been working in for over a decade in the public art realm. All of my pieces are exterior. And this is always like a really important question that people ask is how do we maintain? How can we keep the sculptures vibrant for our communities? And I work in all metal and usually they're an unpainted finish. And uh, this particular one is a brushed stainless steel. And it's just, a, it's a great material that doesn't rust, doesn't fade, doesn't tarnish over time. And it's just really, really great to, to take care of. Um, there's really, I mean, wash it if it needs washing, but other than that, it's, it's really great. Um, and 
as far as I think one of the concerns I, I get a lot is like, how can we have a sculpture that's graffiti resistant? And it's that it really doesn't exist, but this is like the best thing to easily clean um, paint off of the surface without actually tarnishing the surface quality itself. And so that's, a, that's why I chose this material. Excellent, thank you. Um, Kevin? Yeah, so my sculpture would be made out of steel and it's painted through a three-part process, um, alkyd, primer, and then um, enamel paints, and then a really heavy UV clear coat um, that lasts for a really long time. Um, and just like how Beth said, like, you know, re resistant to graffiti um, with the clear coat, that's, you know, the best way to resist that. The graffiti can be removed without harming the paint. Um, the clear coat is resistant to any chemicals that can take off any graffiti and um, it's UV coated. So it lasts for years and years and years without ever needing um, repainting and uh, just, you know, needs a washing every once in a while, a year or twice a year or something, something like that, just to keep it looking good and um, keep the shine real nice. And um, it, just like how Fitzhugh had said in his, if the paint gets chipped or something, we'll have protocols in place that I can provide the exact paint and everything that's needed to touch it up. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Ryan? Yeah. Um, so we get asked this question often because we're telling people to actually physically engage with our work and, and touch it. People become quite nervous about that. But that's allowed us through all of our work is engaging and interactive and learn how to make and use durable materials. Um, this piece would be made out of aluminum um, and have an aluminum structure interior and then would be a three coat powder coat just similar to what Kevin was saying with an epoxy powder and then a clear coat finish to help with that anti-graffiti kind of uh, way of dealing with that. Um, so yeah, we, we really focus on using high quality durable materials that will last over time, but then also knowing that things are going to happen. So we think about easy ways to fix and mitigate those risks. So making it easy to, if we're having the mirrors inside hatches, I can easily pull out the mirrors for the periscope, having like high density polyethylene panels that are crack resistant, that can be easily replaced if need be. So we really focus on knowing that we're, we're allowing people to have those hands-on experience, that if something does happen, like someone comes with a baseball bat in the middle of the night, we can deal with it. Excellent, thank you, Ryan. Okay, I like the minute format for the answers, so I think we will stick to that. We have um, a question specific to Fitzhugh. And so Fitzhugh, I will ask you first, but then I will ask the other artists as well to give everyone a chance to weigh in. Uh, we have a question from Annette. Other than providing a lesson plan for educators, how would you work directly with community members on this project? Um, well, the actual installation process and the, um, you know, the idea of what, how the sculpture came to be, the design of what it is. And, um, you know, unlike, for example, Beth that has stuff that's actually coming from the community um, and others, it doesn't have that, um, you know, that woven into the fibers. So um, honestly, the, the, the lesson plan and having that sort of educational program is the main thing. The other thing which we've done um, in the past in Brooklyn in two places was we uh, worked with um, local dance troops. One was a youth group, um, one was professional dance groups and we hosted, we gave them an opportunity to uh, come up with, conceive of a dance performance to do in and around the piece. Um, and that was another investigation that we had done um, sort of early on in the ideation process here. So I think that would be the other way of activating it would be through performance art in and around the piece. Excellent, thank you. Uh, now we'll, we'll go through to Yeti. Um, how will local, re oops, sorry, where'd it go? I was gonna repeat the question for you, but basically how do you plan on getting the community involved? So I would run um, some mosaic workshops which can be held at the Lynn Museum. I've already spoken to them about that. Um, so I would invi invite organizations to come and uh, participate in, in the workshops and the mosaics, hand on, hands on mosaic making. Um, it can be done with a variety of people, a variety of ages, um, and uh, everybody can participate in that. So I would work with several groups um, to create the mosaics for the, for the sculpture. Excellent, thank you. Beth? 
So mine is more, not really a, a technical hands-on um, building per se, but it's uh, it's more on storytelling. And that's the, the heart of the work that I create. Um, and so it, I usually, um, I was really hopeful that we would get through the pandemic and that I could actually do this in person. And um, there was gonna be a virtual option, but that's um, the heart of who I am and how I like to create is, is to be in the community and to see you face-to-face -face in the flesh and to talk with you and hear your stories um, of your heritage and also your dreams for the future. And so that all happens in person. And uh, it's a way to not only connect me to your community, but it's also a way for you to connect to one another. And the handwritten element is really important for me in this piece because through your handwriting, um, it's it's unique to who you are. And um, you know, my grandmother's handwriting and my toddler's handwriting look very, very different. And what they have to say is very different. And I want that to come through the piece as well as um, as your individuality being um, etched into or cut out of the work, really. So, excellent. Thank you. Um, Kevin. Yes, so community engagement is central to this piece and there's gonna be several different ways of how I would approach this. And one is just the main engagement of trying to get as many people to give me a word that represents themselves, their uniqueness, a core trait or a value. And so ways we're gonna do that, there'll be online forms as well to reach broad swath, but I also wanna work directly with local nonprofits and organizations and agencies that way I can reach uh, marginalized populations and try to work as, with as many different people as I can. Um, I, I will be up in Lynn trying to work directly with these people. I want to, you know, get face to face with folks. And then additionally, um, I've talked with Raw Artworks and we're going to develop a you know, full fledged program with their young artists. So they can develop their own public art concept. Um, and that that represents, you know, something they think would be great for their neighborhood and engages with their community. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, so similar to I think everyone, our, our focus is on, you know, community engagement for this project and, and starting off with the meetings that we did with Danae, who helped hold those with Girls Inc. And kind of that's where this project came from and continuing that dialogue with them and having carried them through the project. And we also see the community kind of informing that in the colors and the viewports of the periscope. So what are those focused on in the area? And then also those destinations that are highlighted by the pieces. So where are we telling people to go? What businesses do you wanna highlight with the work itself? Um, and seeing that kind of change over time. So not just the community engagement from the initial and then from this point, but how can it continue over time where these pieces can change out and these destinations can change in those ways. Um, so that's really how we see kind of that working. Excellent, thank you. Our next question is, is a two-part question from Nicole. One uh, part of the question is for the artists and then actually uh, the second part of the question is most likely for the team. And I do wanna let the audience know uh, that all of the questions will be assembled into a formal Q&A and um, we will be putting those on the cultural district website under the installation page and probably sending out an email um, to all the participants as soon as we have the answer. Some of these questions, we might need to track down the answers, but you know, from the beginning, transparency has been our thing. And so we'll, we'll make sure we get all these questions answered and get it out to everybody. Um, let's see, okay, Nicole asks, will Lynn residents be asked to volunteer in the actual construction of the sculptures? Yeti. Um, so in the construction of the sculpture, no. Um, it's kind of a messy process. And I have a studio lined up, but it's not near Lynn. It's, it's, it's um, out, you know, I had to find a place that, that would be possible to, to work with the, um, the armature um, in place. So no, um, the construction of the sculpture, no, but certainly with the artwork that decorates the sculpture, which is quite a bit of artwork, quite a bit of glass and, mos and uh, ceramic mosaic, yes, much, the community would definitely be involved in hands-on creation of the decorative aspect of the sculpture. Excellent, thank you. It's you. Um, <clears throat> the actual fabrication construction of the work, no, there would, there would not be involvement. Um, it's really about involvement after installation. Um, there, to some extent, you know, the choice of colorway I see as, um, you know, I see that selection as being um, community-led or committee-led um, to some extent, uh, depending on who's truly making that 
call, but beyond that, it's really about once it's there, how it activates and place makes um, uh, beyond. Excellent, thank you, Beth. In the actual actual construction, no, that will be that will be me welding and grinding all that that together. Um, in past projects, we've um, really tried to brainstorm how to do this because people seem to be very interested. I'm like, okay, like teach us as much as you can. We're interested in being a part of the art, making the art. Um, and it becomes kind of tricky with liability insurance for the city and for um, me as an artist. And we've done it in a couple um, past projects to varying levels of success. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit tricky. Um, and I'd love to be able to, to answer that call and that passion for that people have to want to really be a part of it. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it's just not feasible. Okay, Beth, thank you. Kevin? Yeah, just like Beth said, like I've done lots of projects that engage with folks directly in the art making that's piece, but generally those tend to be uh, temporary. Um, and when it's for a permanent piece like this, you know, you, you want the integrity of the fabrication to last a long time. Um, so for this piece, the engagement is really in the content of the piece itself. So each lace um, has all these words. Um, and another engagement I thought of a way to create the content is working with local writers and poets to sort of order and curate how the words fit into each lace. So there's kind of that help in the design aspect as well, but not so far as, you know, the fabrication. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, just to carry off everybody else with the actual physical install of it, the liability reasons, as Beth was saying, you know, we don't usually have the community involved in that process. Um, but one thing we do like to do in that process is make sure that we're there having conversations with the people around. So, you know, having conversations as the piece being installed and explaining kind of what is happening and really having that relationship during that process of time. Another part of it that we see kind of being engaged with is the actual components of the distances that are on each piece. We see actually working with a local artist to really kind of develop what those look like and what those characters of those uh, become. Excellent, thank you. And I, I do want to ask Nicole's second part of the question, which it sounds like in this case, if the artists will really be constructing it on their own, but I think it's a very interesting and valid question to ask. This would be for the team. And I think most likely something for us to consider for the future. Uh, will local residents be temporarily employed to insist in construction? I think that's an awesome question. And the first thing that came to mind my mind, given the timing of it, maybe for future projects is the, um, the city jobs for youth in the summer. I think that would be an awesome, awesome way to um, give some local, some Lynn youth uh, an opportunity to not only work in the summer, um, but you know, make some money and learn some art. Is there anyone else from our team that would like to weigh in on that? I'm not sure if anyone from the city is on this side of the call. But duly noted, Nicole, thank you for that awesome question. And we will get that circulated for the future. Um, let's see, uh, Tia asked the question, well, she has a, a wonderful comment. These are beautiful. Some of these look fun and inviting for little climbers. This might be a two part question for the artists and the members of our team as well. Is there a substrate that will be used underneath? We will have the DPW involved um, for to answer these types of questions as well as we move forward with the installation. We obviously the plans will also be uh, stamped by an engineer for construction viability. But how about for our artists? Uh, Tia thinks these are all beautiful and fun. How do we handle the little climbers? We'll start with you, Yeti. How do we handle the little climbers? Well, the little climbers are invited to climb on the fish. Hopefully, hopefully they won't climb any higher than that. But the fish. <laughs> The fish is meant to be interacted with. Um, I think the idea of having a rubber pad <laughs> as a substrate around it might not be a bad idea. Um, but in general, the, the sculpture is meant to be climbed on. I mean, I, I planned it that, that, that way. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, Yeti, thank you. Um, Fitzhugh. Yeah, so, you know, indeed, similarly, it's meant to be engaged with, climbed through, I would say, sat on within the rings and such. Um, and, you know, this has been a conversation in the past with pretty much every large installation that I've done. And there's some fine line between climbability, knowing that it could happen, 
being aware of the liability. You know, one time we did something in a park where we put a big substrate of, you know, in that case it was on grass. So we were able to do substrate of, uh, of like a mulch. Another spot was a temporary one. You could, in that case, put, uh, you know, rubber pads, but to me, it, I feel like it kind of comes to, I've found that it comes down to the, the municipal sort of group deciding whether they want to put that underneath or whether it's just, you know, through security cameras and they hope that it, that things don't get climbed, you know, too much upon. Um, it's a fine line, you know. Okay, it's you. Thank you. Beth. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> how do we deal with them? Um, and uh, this piece is meant to be interactive and engaging as everyone's is. And uh, I've tried really hard to address this in a variety of ways in past projects, because it is a concern when you have stuff that's out in the open and you want interactive uh, engagement, but how, how far do we want to bring that? Um, so for this piece in particular, when you walk into the center of this, uh, the two heads, they, the inside is all concave surface. And so it's really hard to be able to to, to climb a space that's like that. Now the exterior is really, really smooth and slippery and shiny. So you need, in order to climb, you need a foothold and a handhold. And so um, I've made really sure to, to create angles that are really, really difficult to climb. Um, I'm, where there's a will, there's a way always, you know, there's always that person who's out there that's your, your city monkey that wants to get on top of everything. Um, but I've tried really hard to make it so it's, you know, tactile and safe and engaging for a physical sense, but that you can't get any vertical height on it. Excellent. Thank you, Beth. Kevin. Um, yes. And, and this, like everyone said, this is always a, a concern with any piece of artwork in public, in the public. And, you know, someone wants to climb it, they're going to climb it no matter what you do to try to stop them. Um, and this was also something that uh, a concern that came up after I had put in the initial concept. And so I've already had submitted a, a slight adjustment to the, sh to the shape um, where it kind of takes that wave arch and just kind of cocks it back just a little bit, makes it a little bit harder to climb. Um, and it makes, you, you know, if someone really wants to, they're going to, but that's gotta be someone who knows how to climb. So if, if it's little kids, like this, it's gonna be really difficult for little kids how to climb. And you know, from inside the space, just similar to, to Beth's where it's all um, concave shapes, that is really difficult to climb as well. Okay, Kevin, thank you. Ryan. Yeah, so our team uh, includes, like I come from an architecture background and we have engineers on our team. So we really focus our designs based off local code. So making sure everything's to code standards to make sure that we're mitigating any risk of people climbing on different elements. So really looking at the gaps between things and we also make sure that we're also abiding by universal design principles. So there's enough space and kind of for people to be able to travel through. And we're really focused on using those elements to help mitigate any risk of climbing or any type of interaction that we might not want to happen on the work. Excellent, thank you. We have a question that, again, that will be for the team um, in the city of Lynn our members from the city that are on the call, which again, we'll have to possibly track down this answer and post it later. We have a question from Andrea. Do you have any hopes for the city to add more artistic strategies or efforts to further enhance the area? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> That's my answer to that question. Thank you, Andrea. We will get that answered and post it on our FAQ. Um, let's see. We have a question from Annette, which is specific to Yeti. However, I'm gonna pose the question to all the artists and I, I feel fairly certain I know what the answer would be. Uh, Yeti, I'm familiar with your mosaic animals and I'm wondering if there is any possibility for additional creatures to wander the plaza in the future should more funds become available. And I will ask all the other artists the same question of if we were to avail ourselves of funds. Um, you know, what you think about that, about doing another piece for the city. Uh, Yeti, go ahead. I'd be delighted to do as many animals as you want me to do. <laughs> I could I could draw, paint, sculpt animals all day long. So yes, the money is there. I would love to do them. Okay. <laughs> I think this one's going to go quick. Fits you. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, absolutely. You know, having things in conversation around a neighborhood is really fun. And I've had the chance to do that uh, uh, recently and, and in Brooklyn where you come around a corner and you see one then you go around the corner and you maybe you see the next or you have a little map so that's super fun yeah it would be great awesome Beth yes to, yes to all of it I'm just gonna I'm gonna echo 
um, what's been said already, yeah, it's a great opportunity to have works that either continue a conversation throughout the city or in a different way inside of buildings, or um, it's really fun to explore other ways to connect uh, either the same amount, the same work, or create a completely different uh, dialogue and story in the city somewhere. Excellent. Kevin? Absolutely. I mean, one thing I think I love about my concept of using two laces to create form. Oh, sorry, really sorry. To, you can really use it to kind of create any form. In my, in my original idea, I was kind of thinking of having all these different forms throughout the space of, um, of the plaza. I had designed these benches that were going to go behind it. I had to omit them just for budget reasons. But, you know, if more budget allows, I, you know, would be stoked to create more forms and maybe even have different shoelaces in different places all throughout Lynn. That would be like, you know, a really cool idea. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Ryan? Yeah, I mean, a uh, large part of our work is about putting play and implementing as a part of city infrastructure to include play in everyday spaces. So having components that spawn off of the periscope and become these landmarks and different destinations would be something that we would love to do. So it's not just, again, it's about that journey and traveling through the space to find these other components and really kind of creating that sense of discovery. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Excellent, thank you. I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna get back to Andrea's question, um, and we will ask our awesome team member Lauren Drago from the City of Lynn Planning Department, uh, who will weigh in on: Do you have any hopes for the city to add more artistic strategies or efforts to further enhance the area? And I think the artist did a good job of covering that also in our last question, uh, Lauren. Yeah, I'm happy to touch to touch base on this question. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the associate planner for the city of Lynn, still pretty new to the area, but there's so much energy around this part of the city. I know from the business owners that are in the area to the nonprofits that call that area of the city home to the many, many creative organizations who've done events in this district. Our farmer's market is there all the time. Um, this is just a really awesome place for things like installation and additional creative energies to be happening. Uh, we also have the park right across the street. We're going to have a new statue going in there. So I would love to be brainstorming um, about other ideas to activate that area, find a way to use the viaduct storefronts under the railway bridge. Um, so yes, I share the high, high hopes for additional artistic um, interventions in this area. And I'm definitely open to ideas and suggestions from folks uh, who have thoughts about what they'd like to see there. Excellent, thank you, Lauren. Uh, perfect timing as we're coming to the end of our Q&A session. We have one question left specifically to Yeti. However, I'm gonna toss it out to all the artists and give you all an opportunity to give the audience um, your websites and where your work can be found. Uh, question from Emmanuel. Yeti, do you have any other examples of your mosaic work? Um, I do, you can go to my website to see them, uh, which is yeti.com, not to be confused with the cooler company. <laughs> so it's, it's my website is yetti.com. Excellent, thank you, Yeti. Fits you? Uh, yep, you know, yeah, I've got a website. It's my full name, fitzucarroll.com. And um, there are examples of uh, work on a similar scale. Uh, we have completed some, some, some permanent, some temporary uh, large works that are all visible there. Um, and yes, that's all the, that's the whole question, right? It is the whole question. Yes, okay. thank you, Fitzy. <laughs> um, Beth. Yes, uh, mine is also my name, just my name, BethNybeck.com, and all my work can be found there, and I'd love for you to check it out. Excellent, thank you. Kevin? Yes, um, OrlowskiStudio.com um, is my public art website. Uh, my wife and I are team on that. Um, I also have a website that's just my name, KevinOrlowski.com, but it doesn't have as much as my public art stuff, more of my personal artwork. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Ryan. Uh, yeah, you can see our work at uh, theurbanconga.com and then also like on social media channels at theurbanconga as well. Excellent, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I'm going to toss it back over to Carolyn. Uh, thank you to all who have participated and have asked these amazing questions and take it away, Carolyn. Oh my goodness, I am speechless and that doesn't happen. <laughs> 
excellent job, Carla. And thank you to all, you know, uh, really significant, pivotal information, uh, great questions uh, from this community. They are so invested in this, um, which we've been telling you all along, but you know, we can brag about this community for, for ages. Uh, so with that, we have concluded our Q&A portion of tonight's session. Thank you all uh, for your engagement and participation. And now that you've had the chance to hear from each artist and learn about their concepts and ask them questions, it is time to hear from you, community. Um, so Lynn's community, uh, invest in the process. Again, I always say this, invest in the process so you can be invested in the product. Uh, please visit Lynn's new community engagement platform, lynnincommon.com, to share your input and cast your vote by July 15th. Write that down and please, please share this information with all of your friends uh, and on all of your respective platforms. Again, that is Lynn in Common, L Y N N I N C O M M O N dot com. Uh, you can revisit all of our artist submissions and concepts that you saw today. Uh, you can have your say in who moves forward. That is right. We are putting the public in public art. What a concept. Um, and again, you know, all you've all contributed such amazing things to this space. Um, as Lauren uh, reiterated over the years, the block parties, the Ironbound, the live music, the public art uh, just goes on and on. Um, you've all affected this community in such positive ways. And now's the time to contribute your voice to this long-term installation to complement all of your efforts uh, over the years. So that is it for us here today. Thank you all for joining us once again. Thank you so much to our artists for all your exceptional work and your dedication towards this project. We have not made it easy. I'm partially blaming the pandemic, but I know it's not, you know, you can only blame that for so long. <laughs> you all have been amazing to work with. Um, and we'd be lucky to work with each and every one of you going forward. Honestly, I say that sincerely. Um, from a proud Linner. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions on this project, our process, etc., please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, to Carla, to Lauren. We'll put our email address in the chat for you. And from your Linstallation team, go vote. And good night. <laughs>